Assalamu alaikum and welcome. We're going to be discussing comprehensive education. And here with me is Dr. Bilal Phillips from Canada. We have Dr. Jaffa Idris from Sudan. And Dr. Mamdoua Mohammed from the USA. I'm Omar Dexter, your host from the UK. Dr. Bilal Phillips, would you like to start, please? The topic of comprehensive education, uh, from my perspective, is that from a Muslim or Islamic historical context, education was always comprehensive. Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, had said, seeking knowledge is obligatory on every Muslim. And it was understood from that time that it was all knowledge, though religious knowledge was primary. I mean, this is the beginning point, but that it wasn't limited to religious knowledge, but would include all areas of knowledge. So from that early beginning, we can see that sciences and the various other fields uh, flourished in places like Spain and Baghdad, etc. And nobody questioned the fact that there are no limits to knowledge. It was comprehensive. So you found a scholar may be a scholar of Islamic law, and at the same time, he was a specialist in optics, or he was also an astronomer, and you know, so you found that, that blend in the Muslim world historically. And I think that it's really only since the introduction of secularist thought where people wanted to separate religion from the rest, right? that we now found schools uh, being separated out. You don't teach religion in schools anymore. So you have schools which focus on secular education, then you have schools which focus on religious education. And actually, even in Christian tradition, you know, the monks in Europe, I mean, they were the people who had the knowledge, the, the monasteries and that. They, they were the religious representatives and they had the knowledge. Yes, yes. And they came and they learned amongst the Muslims, brought that knowledge back, etc. So it's really in the last 200 years, really, or maybe less, that the education became split, so we no longer had comprehensive education anymore. And I think also, uh, the, as a result of this, something else happened. For example, at the time of the Prophet and uh, early ages, uh, no one thought of religious people as being in a class uh, of um, people who don't know much about the world, and um, who cannot be uh, consulted when it comes to economics or, or politics. Or, this was not the case uh, at the time of the Prophet and the companions of the Prophet. They knew whatever other Arabs knew at that time. They knew the, the geography of their country very well. They were very much versed in their language. They knew about the different uh, the tribes, uh, who is the son of who, what this tribe uh, is related to the other tribe. And as you said, this made them later on also uh, acquire uh, other kinds of knowledge without feeling that they are doing something that is uh, foreign to their religion. If uh, many of the learned people, and this I think is what we now should do, uh, they were not, for example, Abu Hamid al-Ghazal, he was not a specialist in uh, in say medicine or astronomy or so, Al-Ghazali was not. A, but they knew what the people at that time knew about uh, astronomy. I sometimes say that Al-Ghazali and Ibn Taymiyyah's uh, knowledge of astronomy is more than the knowledge of some uh, sheikhs at the present time, in spite of the increase in the knowledge of this. Ibn Taymiyyah said that he argued with the philosophers at the age 14, <laughs> Al-Ghazali wrote his book, Tahafut uh, al-Falasifa, something like the destruction of the philosophers and so on. He said that he spent two years studying philosophy, and two years by a person like Al-Ghazali is equal to 10 years or 20 years by an ordinary person. And when he wrote that book and it was published, it was said that that was the death of philosophy. So I agree with you that uh, this was the case in early times. No. If I, might, I can add something to this, I would say that madrasas, this term now, that spreads in different countries, is a clear representation of the separation between 
secular studies and uh, Islamic studies. This would lead the people to think who work. People who work as leaders in these schools or the community would need to work on the madrasas, the form of the madrasas that's going on right now, to change this form to its original Islamic origin. In other words, that we need to add some of these subjects that are necessary for uh, fitting in and living into uh, this world, in addition to our uh, courses in Quran and Sira and Hadith and Aqeedah, we need to add some of the courses related to science and math and these issues because this would prepare a graduate of these schools to fit very well in the world nowadays. So I think we, the people who are responsible for madrasas, uh, they need to look into the definition of uh, comprehensive education as understood by the Prophet وسلم, and the companions and we need to go back to basics and follow this model. I think this would be a great benefit to uh, the Muslims who lead these schools. But I think this, uh, this development really was a result of the period of colonization. You know, when European colonization affected the Muslim world and education now meant conversion to Christianity because they set up the schools. If Muslim kids would go to those schools, then they could see what was happening. They would be converted. So parents kept their children back from the schools and, and uh, developed these alternative schools. But of course, it, you know, it, it, and that's what has sort of left a legacy in many of the countries where you have you know, Muslims and non-Muslims, that the non-Muslims would have advanced in that colonial system. And they ended up uh, taking the reins of, of power in the country after the colonials left. And the Muslims tended to be backwards. And, and the backwardness was always you know, a result, as it was seen, of madrasa education. So even the modern Muslims, Muslims who felt, you know, we need to be a part of this development and, you know, be more modern, etc., they look down at the madrasas as a result of that, not really realizing that their parents, in choosing that, were trying to save their faith. You know, this was the intent. And I can tell you from experience, I went to school uh, when the Sudan was under British rule. And... Uh, uh, well, I still thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I went to these uh, British schools <laughs> uh, because I could combine what is called secular education with what is called religious education because at, uh, at school, the Islamic period, they call it period, uh, was uh, only one in a week. And it was, there were seven periods in the, uh, day. In, in the day. And this was the last period when you are tired and you are, you are sleepy <laughs> and so on. And you didn't have to pass uh, in this Islamic education to have your uh, certificate. certificate. So I can tell you, yes, from experience. And at the same time, just as you said, you had in the Sudan, these were called Mahad, not Madrasa. Mahad, Mahad. And there, the students at that early time, they were not taught anything except in Islam, and not even Islam of the Quran and the Sunnah, just some uh, uh, fiqh and Arabic and, and, and so on. And when they graduated, there was no... No future. No, no future for them, yeah. Uh, I think on another level, we need to address the issue of those people who studied at, if we can call them, secular school. They became engineers, they became doctors, and now, when they graduate from the universities, uh, they need some sort of Islamic education to have a balance in their character, in Islamic character. How can we do this job, achieve this job, in order to enrich them with the knowledge that is necessary for them to be good Muslims? Have any maybe. experience in uh, Britain? Yeah, I think in reality, maybe, well, before I answer that one, I think, I think part of the baseline to it is say, well, had the children been brought up in a proper Islamic education from a young age, like a comprehensive education from a young age, then you'd hope that that have that baseline. They would learn how to pray. They would learn the fundamentals of their religion, their aqidah, before they come on to the aspects of like university education. So it's kind of like topping up the foundation. Uh, but this is now, alhamdulillah, in some 
at least Arab schools at that, at that time, you know, and before you come to the university, you will have good knowledge, a good knowledge of these basics of the of the aqidah, uh, fiqh. So this is still the case in some uh, parts of the Arab world. But still we have one or two million Muslims who graduate every year from the universities who, and who don't have background in Islam and we need to address those ones. How can we teach them some Islamic courses or what are the ways that uh, would help them inshallah to get the balance in their Islamic character? Explore the options, match the qualities, assure the success. What happens at school, or more specifically, what happens inside the classroom? The classroom. The classroom. Good qualities of classrooms, interactive, challenging, collaborative, Distributive focus, student-centered. Let's together examine the quality of education that is provided to our children. To judge this quality precisely, join me on Peace TV. Join Dr. Mamdou Muhammad in Teaching at School every Sunday, Tuesday and Thursday at 6 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 7 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. A friendly message by Dr. Zakir. The fastest growing religion in the world. A survey was published in the Reader's Digest Almanac Yearbook, 1983, which was also reprinted in the Plain Truth magazine, February 1984. This survey gave the statistics of the increase in the percentage of the major world religions in a span of 50 years. From 1934 to 1984. The religion which increased the maximum at number one position was Islam, which increased by 235%. Christianity, only 47%. Which war took place between 1934 and 1984, which forced millions of people to accept Islam? Which sword was used? According to the latest statistics today, the fastest growing religion in America is Islam. The fastest growing religion in Europe is Islam. The fastest growing religion in the world is Islam. Which sword is forcing tens of thousands of Americans to accept Islam? Tens of thousands of Europeans to accept Islam? Millions of people in the world to accept Islam. Which sword? It is the sword of Islam. The sword of peace. The sword of truth and wisdom. Which gives the solution to the problems of humanity. Peace TV. The solution for humanity. Even if you get it right now, you might find as um, if we get that process of education started from an early age now you might find there's a whole yeah. generation of people caught in the system before it's it reaches that before it reaches through yeah. so the question uh, that dr mamdouh is is raising here is what do we do now I mean, yes for those we, ones. we know what we would like to see you know that comprehensive education being introduced but what do we do now for people who are already in the system or who have already graduated from the system, like yourself, you accepted Islam, you know, um, you had already completed various elements of your education, and now you needed to develop the Islamic side. I could say from my experience, because I also came from a science background, I was a biochemistry major in university, you know, before converting to Islam and then going to study in Medina that uh, in my studies there, for example, when we were taking um, the inheritance laws, the, the mode by which they were being calculated was according to mathematics, you know, of 800, 900 years ago. I could see by making some equations, you know, some <laughs> 
that you could resolve. I was able to figure out the problem. The teacher mentioned the problem. I figured it out on paper. And they would spend the whole period working on how to do this problem, you know. And I just said, if you make this one X and you put that one as Y and you do this and that, you get, to, you know. Algebra. But, yeah, some algebra in there. And, and Muslims were the ones who invented algebra also, right? But in spite of that, the, the so method... So ultimately the someone was, did this. Yeah, so eventually, yes. Yeah. Finally, that resolved a lot of that. But that is because of the, the lack of many of the students and the teachers themselves. They came from the quote-unquote madrasa education. So they didn't have sufficient exposure to mathematics to learn the latest develops in mathematics and then apply it to those areas of Islamic learning you know, where it was applicable. What happens but now? Now this is an example of someone. Let us now uh, enumerate how one can uh, acquire both kinds of knowledge. Now this is an example, yours and his. So, no, yours. You studied biochemistry. Then you went to a proper... Uh, an Islamic institution. So that is the ideal, I think. But not everyone can do that. Most people, can. You know, most people can. And by the way, we have to say also, how can someone uh, who graduated in Islamic studies acquire what is called the secular education? Here also you will find the ideal. Some people graduated, say, from Medina or any Islamic uh, university and went to America or so and studied, say, economics and said, my son, the, for this. So again, this is an ideal. Not, not everyone can do that. So what is the next best? What is the next best thing to, in combining this with that or that uh, with this? Okay, one, one idea would be after a person graduates from the university, if he graduated from an Islamic university and he has an option to study in America or in England, he would be lucky. But how about if he studied in the Middle East and still the educational system at universities does not allow everybody to continue his education. I think continuous education after graduation by getting some courses here and there from different universities, if I'm a graduate of an Islamic university, in Egypt and there is an opportunity or a window of opportunity that I can select to study at Cairo University, for example, a course in physics or a course in math, that would be wonderful. That's why I think... But that is not available now. It is available in the States and it's Europe and Australia. And I wish that the, the education in the Middle East would change towards achieving this goal in, uh, in order to have uh, this balanced uh, graduate from Islamic background to add to him or to her some uh, courses, secular courses that he would need or she would need uh, in her lifetime. No, this things, is one let option. us just assume that things are there. as they are now. Okay. How can I, who started in this field or that field, how can I acquire the knowledge of the other, uh, the secular uh, yeah. or the Islamic? I would say uh, distance education and e-learning is an option that's available to many people nowadays. You don't need to travel to that country or this country, uh, or rather you can sit at home and you join one of these universities and you get some courses in that. I think uh, distance education in the coming few decades will play a great role in, in uh, educating Muslims from both directions, who got Islamic education from one side and want to complete it by secular courses, if we can say that, and vice versa, those who have a uh, secular background and they want to complete it by, yes. And there are some nowadays, there are some uh, Islamic educational, distance education schools now. They are in the States, they are in London, and there are many countries, alhamdulillah, it's still in the beginning, but I think it will fill the gap that is needed by the two parts. I think also uh, for those who uh, come from what we may call secular educational backgrounds, I mean, by attending conferences, yeah, one you know, um, they will get that regularly, they get that exposure to different areas of learning. Um, we, we now have a lot of courses being offered in masjids, in, you know, it's in certain, of course, it will vary from country to country, but uh, these courses are being made more and more available. A lot more books have been written. You know, um, especially, that, for example, in English, things have been translated, books are being written. So a person, I mean, he does, no one really has an excuse 
uh, to not avail themselves of some of this uh, information, you know. So I think that uh, this is part of the future trend that more and more people, you know, should be encouraged to step out of their field and to be exposed to those other areas of knowledge. One other way, of course, is the, the role of imams. If each imam, for example, would teach a course in tafsir for one or two months, the people in his area would benefit from this course. And he finishes the course in tafsir. After one or two months, he would cover another subject of aqidah or something like this. And this way, in, during two or three or four or five years, you would find the audience, the regular audience who attend regularly, I think they will benefit a lot, and this would, would help a lot. So imams should stick to their main role, not just by leading people in the prayers, but the main mission would be educating others, yes, at the minimum that's required by every Muslim to have a balanced character. I think we forgot also one important thing, and that yeah. is the internet. Oh, yeah. Now, now there are many sites where one can say study how to recite uh, the Quran. Recently I saw something, perhaps you knew it before, but uh, I was amazed to find that you can, uh, you can study 10 Qur'at in one of these uh, sites. And the advantage of the, of the sites and of the recording is that you can listen to it as many times uh, <laughs> you want. If you study under a uh, sheikh, you will listen just once or twice. Next time you come and he rebukes you for... <laughs> for, for not. But now you can uh, study this to your own pace. And the same, uh, the same with uh, non-Islamic. I don't like to call them non-Islamic or secular because all these are Islamic, uh, Islamic, Islamic in the sense that uh, Islam approves of them and that the Muslims need them. You, need, you can't say mathematics is, is a secular subject, that uh, physics is a secular su subject, because uh, we have to, to study physics as, uh, as Muslims. So there are ways now, many means of acquiring this uh, kind of knowledge uh, by the, uh, through the internet or uh, videos, um, DVDs and uh, books on tape and then uh, there are now channels hmm? I know that uh, the BBC for example when I was in Britain uh, they used to have what, the, what is the radio or the television BBC, I am not BBC sure radio. What, radio how to learn not only English but for the British to learn Russian uh, German, French, something, yes, this used to be the case. So there are sites now like this. In some countries, I think now in Egypt, there are educational, uh, educational channels. The whole, the whole channel will be just for education, helping uh, viewers to study mathematics or sciences don't need any uh, experiments that you can just listen to and understand. You have uh, actually in the West these channels like the Discovery Channel, yeah, okay. you know, um, National Geographic, you know, where there people are being exposed to a variety of different uh, fields, scientific yeah. fields, through a sort of a user-friendly approach, you know, as opposed to a professor there giving you a lesson, yeah. you know, you see it in practice, what this yeah. looks like and so on. So it's, I think these are going a long way towards that too. At the same time, I expect from TV channels like Peace TV uh, to have some educational material. I mean, regular studies uh, or regular teaching of a course. And they would test it because it goes to different people all over the world. I think this is a challenge for uh, Peace TV and other uh, channels to use uh, their facilities in order to teach the Muslims everywhere in the world. Yeah, I think this would be something good in order to compensate it. English-speaking Muslims, which is, yes, they are not a small number. <laughs> don't, don't you think that people really need to establish the fact that they need to learn from, yeah. you know, throughout their lives? Because you mentioned about um, the imam there giving people lessons over various different aspects of Islam. But I think there's a certain a matter of educating the people to realise that they need to be educated. Oh, yeah. 
How do you think we, yeah, we, we managed to we do have that? To motivate them. Exactly, yeah, yeah, to get them to attend the courses so they can be educated. It seems to be a little breakdown in that when that we have, alhamdulillah, so many people trying to make such striving to provide this education, yet you find one of the breakdowns is that people aren't uh, forthcoming in having that full attendance. But I, I, think this is, I, th I think this is a result of the, the role of the mosque being lost. You know, the masjid, which was a central place where the Prophet Wasallam taught from, you know, outside it in the Sufa, the, some of the companions would stay there and teach others who came. So it was an area of learning, you know, uh, whereas today the mosque is just for ritual prayer. You go and you pray and you go. The Imam leads the prayer, that's his job, he's paid for that job and he goes. Yeah. So that, that sense of the, the mosque being the heart of the community where people come and be educated there, you know, and hold courses in there, I think that was somewhat lost. But I think in, in more recent times, some of the mosques have become, you know, Islamic centers. versed in their language. They knew about the different uh, tribes, uh, who is the son of who, what this tribe uh, is related to the other tribe. And as you said, this made them later on also uh, acquire uh, other kinds of knowledge without feeling that they are doing something that is uh, foreign to their religion. If uh, many of the learned people, and this I think is what we now should do. Uh, they were not, for example, uh, Abu Hamid al-Ghazal, he was not a specialist in, uh, in say, medicine or astronomy or so. Al-Ghazali was not. A, but they knew what the people at that time knew about uh, astronomy. I sometimes say that al-Ghazali and Ibn Taymiyyah's uh, knowledge of astronomy is more than the knowledge of some uh, sheikhs at the present in that day. They were the religious representatives and they, and they had the knowledge. Scientists. Yes, yes. And they came and they learned amongst the Muslims, brought that knowledge back, etc. So it's really in the last 200 years, really, or maybe less, that the education became split. So we no longer had comprehensive education anymore. And I think also uh, that as a result of this, something else happened. For example, at the time, of the prophet and uh, early ages. And no one thought of religious people as being uh, in a class uh, of um, people who don't know much about the world and um, who cannot be uh, consulted when it comes to economics or, or politics. Or, this was not the case uh, at the time of the prophet and the companions of the prophet. They knew whatever other Arabs knew at that time. They knew the, the geography of their country very well, etc. And nobody questioned the fact that there are no limits to knowledge. It was comprehensive. So you found a scholar may be a scholar of Islamic law, and at the same time, he was a specialist in optics, or he was also an astronomer, and you know. So you found that, that blend in the Muslim world historically. And I think that it's really only since the introduction of secularist thought where people wanted to separate religion from the rest, right? that we now found schools uh, being separated out. You don't teach religion in schools anymore, so you have schools which focus on secular education, then you have schools which focus on religious education. And actually, even in Christian tradition, you know, the monks in Europe, I mean, they were the people who had the knowledge, the, the monasteries from Sudan, Dr. Mamdoua Mohammed from the USA. I'm Omar Dexter, your host from the UK. Dr. Bilal Phillips, 
Would you like to start, please? The topic of comprehensive education, uh, from my perspective, is that from a Muslim or Islamic historical context, education was always comprehensive. Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, had said, seeking knowledge is obligatory on every Muslim. And it was understood from that time that it was all knowledge, though religious knowledge was primary. I mean, this is the beginning point but that it wasn't limited to religious knowledge, but would include all areas of knowledge. So from that early beginning, we can see that sciences and the various other fields uh, flourished in places like Spain and Baghdad. Assalamu alaikum and welcome. We're going to be discussing comprehensive education. And here with me is Dr. Bilal Phillips from Canada. We have Dr. Jaffa Idris.